implementation side of things. So my job actually is to go around the different agencies and for those of you who know the government domain, you know how many agencies I'm talking about. So we, I, I, I've been working with, I see a lot of familiar faces actually today. I mean, they are partners and things like that. So I work with the agencies. We take whatever concepts and uh, some of those templates that was built by Hunter and Samuel. So we try to templatize it and we try to implement it on a different agency on the ground, right? So I, I'll attempt to cover some experiences, how we do it, what basically what are we doing, how are we doing it, and some of the challenges that we face and what we think would be, um, you know, if you were to do the same thing with like us, see whether you can learn from some of the learning points uh, uh, that we gather. Okay, um, just one slide, we talk a lot about IAC, the benefit of it. So, so a lot of our agencies workload today, as Chow Ho opening has shared, it is pretty much on-prem, okay, or a bit more traditional. We, 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 we do have uh, Kubernetes running and stuff like that, but there's also a big chunks of systems that are on you know, the Solaris, WebLogic, GlassFish. You know, those are the familiar names to some of the people in the room. Okay, so how do we actually typically provision those resources? We do it via ad hoc script, we do it via manual commands, configuration tools, right? So a lot of issues, inconsistency, slow human error and things like that. And a lot of our agencies, we work through partners. We work through, van, uh, I would call partners, right? Uh, um, um, system integrators, for example. We also have our own uh, developer team. So the same issues will be faced, whether it's outsource, insource, and whatever. Not. So, so we see a lot of those things. So with IAC automation, so the beauty of IAC is that um, um, I think Samuel and Hunter has covered pretty much. We talk about the speed. We talk about the consistency. One of the key things is version control. The minute you remove human out of the equation, we need not go and find hey, which engineer or administrator A, B or C making changes to certain resources. Uh, mistakes are made, we try to find someone who, is going to, who did it and stuff like that. Those days are gone with a proper implementation of ISC. All right? We have done it and we can see that it is really beneficial and it's quite fast as well. Okay? Weeks can turn into maybe a couple of days or in cloud, it's just hours, okay? So, one slide, we talk about the beauty of IAC, right? So, what are our experiences in uh, implementing IAC across different agencies? Bring you to this interesting that was like that I cooked up some time back <laughs> yesterday night. You know some of the names here? No, data, physical data center, hyper-converged devices for the more recent one, or God forbid, if you guys are still running the older Sun servers and whatever, not Oracle servers and things like that, a lot of us came from this world, all right? There are still system running, running um, this sort of technology, older technology. Multiple hosting environment, we have government data centers, government agencies. We have our own servers running in our own data centers, all right? Recapper with network, those of you guys who are on cloud, do you guys still do? No, I'm an old timer. I do network, I do call switches, you know, familiar? So, do you guys still do things like that? No, security group, Nickel, stuff like that. Everything is, has changed in a sense, okay? So, when we move to cloud, the journey to move to cloud, basically there are a couple of strategies. We can either do rehost or re-platform, refactor, re-architect the whole system. But the key point that I want to make is that regardless of which uh, uh, strategy that we have chosen, ISC, ISC really helps, really helps. Even in a simple lift and shift rehost, we move our on-prem server. For example, our say um, web logic. Web logic can run on cloud, a bit more expensive than than the other Tomcats and whatever not. But it can still run on cloud, for example. But does it help if I use IAC? Yes. And we have actually really run it. So later I share with you some of the things that we did in order to uh, achieve the, the so-called the benefit of running IAC. Okay, so what have we done? The first thing that we have done is actually coming up with a standardized reference architecture. We find it very important. So coming back to the question earlier on, right? So ISC templates, Terraform templates, you spin off resources. It can never be one size fit all, okay? When we are dealing with um, agencies, say 60 agencies, 100 agencies, hundreds of systems out there, how do we actually make use of IAC? Big full use of ISC. We can't come up with a simple ISC to talk about. I spin off ALB, I have a web, I have an app, I have an RDS running on MS SQL. It will not work this way because different system has different requirements. 
Okay, standardized reference architecture is important to us, so we have to cover up. There are different uh, 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 types of, uh, say, uh, subnets, right? So pretty much uh, 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 agencies, we just have a few different archetypes, reference archetypes. The IAC will map into the archetypes and it will work better, okay? So the second thing is, is about um, the, the parameterized way of handling IAC templates. You need to feed uh, 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 instruction information. IAC means you have to describe the environment, so IAC can spin off based on your description, okay? But if you hard code it, you describe it into the script itself, you are going to grapple with 100 systems, you are, come, you are going to come up with a few hundred IAC templates. You have your UAT, you have your SIT, you have your production environment and things like that. Doesn't make sense. So IAC has to be reusable and parameterized. That will make the most sense, right, when you are implementing IAC. And of course, there's one more thing that is equally important to us in which we have built are standard images. So when you do, whether you do immutable infrastructure or not, the ISC typically has to speed off resources you have to pull from standard image build. So that's something that we have done as well. And the most, I'll go deeper into the topic, but the, the most important concept that we have in mind with a combination once we set off to design a standard reference architecture, we know the few archetypes, that's when we translate to a few different type of standard images and models as well. So if there are standard agents and plugins and software, pre-baked into the agent, spin it up. Things that are not covered, uh, that need to be configured further, the, the user data portion and stuff like that can take care of that. All right. All right. <coughs> okay. This is a typical deployment architecture. Sorry, I use AWS. I didn't use Azure and, uh, and Google. So this is just an example so of a typical reference architecture. So what did we do? Just now we talked about, I, I talked about ready to use Infra as a code Terraform templates for deployment resources. So what we come up with are standard reference architecture such as this. This is just an example. Okay. So all the security government compliance that we need to comply to, we actually configure it as part and parcel of a standard template. All right. We also build hardened uh, standard images. We bake with some of the common uh, uh, plugin and agents that we need. And yeah, so all the agents will be there. Okay, a bit more details, uh, a little bit of secret sauce, but this is what we did. So we standardized a more complex reference architecture such as this. I blurred it up, but we have a full documentation. Whole of government have access to this. You guys doesn't, sorry. So, <laughs> so what we did was that we have a, a, a level approach. For example, when we talk about infra as an architecture, the standard build itself, we focus on the operating system first. That's level one. All right, standardized. So we have a couple of flavors today. We have Red Hat Linux, we have Windows, AWS Linux 2, CentOS, and stuff like that. Okay. So we have a few flavors. Then we are also building application-specific template. Right. So these are just examples. This is not 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 the full list. So to give you a feel, as we build the OS level level one templates, then we build level two templates. So as we work with partners, right. So you guys have different type of deployment model, deployment architecture, but because of the standard reference architecture, you just need to pick one or two. And it's reusable, it's parameterized. Your specific stuff that is your CIDR ranges information, your security group information, your network security group for Azure side, those stuff you can parameterize and put it up in a configuration file, but the template remain the same. That's how we reuse templates, all right, across multiple deployment environment. So we'll continue to expand the scope. We have started doing this for a while now, so we'll continue to expand the scope as our coverage grows bigger and bigger. Okay, so I talked about what we did, right? So did we actually put into practice? These are not theory. We are actually running actual production system right now doing by doing this. So CICD, you just want to talk about CICD. So this is a typical map of CICD. So there are a lot of testing from static code scan, software composition analysis test, dynamic test, all the way. So what happened is that at the point of deployment, code promotion, ISC comes in, so you can merge it, depending whether we talk about GitOps or some other tools, we have, we have different type of tools, right? So just on the, the, the different agencies may use different tools, but we hope to go down the route of what Samuel and Hunter were sharing. But today, how the agencies are doing it is that at the point where resources are being spin off, that's when ISC comes in, all right? And uh, the patched and the hardened uh, the, the, the other key point about the standard build, I forgot to mention, is about the hardening side of things. 
for those of us who run enterprise class systems, operating system itself, it is not to pick up from a standard image build. Not as simple as that. So there are a lot of uh, standards that we need to comply to. The most popular one are the CIS standard, for example. You can pre-harden images. You can, once you pre-harden it, every time you spin the resources, at least it's guaranteed that it is hardened to a certain level, right? So unless, of course, someone go and tweak it or, or subsequently you know, log in, create a bastion host, went in and make changes, but not supposed to, right? If it is an immutable infrastructure. There's a whole lot of topic that we can talk about that, but, but won't have enough time. We talk about controls, network, access control and things like that, of not being able to do it. But the concept of how we handle this is that we want every agency, um, when we implement this, to have a standardized way, to have a compliant and a secure image to be put out using reusable templates. That's the whole concept behind this. Okay, just one slide. This is how we do our standard golden image. So what happened is that we have some source image, we have some processors, so we do the hardening, so that's how we get a GovTech golden image. But once we harden it, some agencies may say, hey, I need your hardening is too tight or too loose. I want to do something else, right? So they can actually um, tag it, check it in, and further tweak their own hardening to their whatever standard that they are required. But this base will always remain, right? So subsequently, as they provision the servers, the patching can also come in if they're not using immutable. We have some agencies um, that are still not using full immutable infrastructure quite yet, right? So we can still use IAC. So what I'm trying to share is that the IAC, the golden image concept, actually still works for us based on our experience, whether it's immutable infrastructure or a typical traditional type of ops before we fully move into immutable infrastructure, patching and things like that. It, it will still work as per how we run a typical workload, whether it's on cloud, on-prem or whatever. Not. Okay. So if you want to run it in a, immutable infra way or you have auto scale resources you can scale it using the standard image that's what uh, uh, we have done so as you scale it you can actually uh, continuously patch and maintain the image from the source no more operational overhead this is some what some agency has done to totally remove the need of managing our typical patching in infra monitoring whatever not so it could be a weekly rebuild, daily, I mean nightly rebuild kind of thing, blue-green deployment matches um, 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 with a uh, uh, pooling or creation of resources from a standard image, hardened. All right, this is yet another concept that we have learned. So I only have a couple more slides left, all right? So these are what most of the agencies have done. So we changed the way we work, actually. So as it changed the way we work, more automation sounds very good, right? Sounds like... Um, remove a lot of operational overhead and things like that. But there are still quite a fair bit of challenges that we encountered. So I just want to share a quick one. So it's like an oxymoron thing. So we do IAC to remove human error. But the question is, if you use IAC, would there still be human error? The answer is yes. At least the initial part, whoever that creates the template and whoever runs the template. So there were occasions that previously when you do a human error, you may you know, shut down a service and things like that. That template is so powerful, actually, as a, at a click of a button, if you have configured it wrongly, you, have, you, you configure the, the, the as you, as you uh, 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 do the Terraform plan, you know, when, when once you run it, you may wipe out your whole environment. We have not had uh, such unfortunate incident on production environment yet, but as we experiment and test it out, things like that do happen. So, so mitigation, we need to use a lot of other automation tools, cloud resources. You know, if we can use inspector, use inspector. You know, you can set up alert and things like that. Certain things that you watch out for, right? Or Azure, you can use Azure Security Center. And access, limit access. So some of us work for enterprise environment. So there's a partner vendor relationship between our, uh, our own guys uh, uh, as an end user. So the access control and things like that has to be properly managed. Governance, SOP changes, Hunter, uh, 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 Samuel talked about CAB, change advisory board processes. With IAC, how is it being handled? So imagine there's no git off, for example. Your, your CAB process is a okay in. But that's why git ops, git ops is useful and that's the right way to go. <laughs> right? So I think, I think the key point is that system administrator as we develop IAC, uh, my personal view is that 
administrator need to have a developer mindset in order to make this whole thing works, right? So the first thing that typically, I don't change a firewall rule, I deploy a new application system. What do you all do? You all remote in, right? Then you all tweak the firewall, right? You all in the cloud, you remote in and you make a, a change in a security group and network. The key point is that if you are doing the full ISC work, the developer mindset, shift left, change it via the code, check in the code, let it run through the pipe, and then let it create again. And because if you use Terraform, there's a state, it will only make a, a, a so-called make changes based on the delta differences, for example. Changes will be enforced. So the key point is that the whole uh, uh, ecosystem of whoever that is managing using IAC, based on our experience, the whole concept and the whole mindset has to change. Else this thing won't work out. Including users, I mean the agency themselves as well. They, they, they need to understand some of those things. Okay? And of course, discipline to check in configuration changes. After a while, you have 10 versions lying around IAC. Hey, which IAC, which script, which is the latest version and things like that. If you don't properly manage that, all hell will break loose again, right? The form of documentation of the yesteryears, now you document it via the script. The script is your documentation, all right? So that's something that we learn. Of course, there are learning curves, right? Uh, competencies and things like that. So that's where we hope through sessions like this, create more awareness, you know, we can start to build a stronger community to be able to handle uh, uh, infra as code and, and beyond for Last slide. Any question? Wait, I, I, sorry. I, I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Regarding the database migration, yeah. Oh, the agency migration that you mentioned earlier, right? I think yeah. probably database is a probably most challenging. So, so when you migrate, how how would they migrate? Would they do a git and shift VM to VM, or or would you normally encourage them to change the database platform? From, from okay, to the, the question is out of topic a little bit, but I don't mind talking. Lah, huh? So I'm an infra guy after all. So the, the question is about data migration. I presume, because I can't remember you, so you're dealing with one of the projects that's migrating to cloud, right? Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> so, so, so the question is that it all has to do, in my personal view, the business matters, right? As you migrate data, as you migrate data, there are a couple of ways of doing it. You can either do a full shutdown, shutdown, downtime, long time, migrate data, big bang approach, bring the thing up, high risk, longer period, or migrate data one time, subsequently sync databasing, find an. Uh, 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 Old school like Oracle mm. database, right? Yep. I saw I saw the now VM. Yep. Uh, let's say when because you know, on and, and my understanding, uh, mm. most of the cloud and 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 it's only doing support Oracle. Yep. Except for RDS, uh. Yep. Uh, so so in the case of SR data, right? How what's the strategy? What's the recommended? Do you, do you force them to change database or change to something that's but let's say for example Azure for example Azure only have two type of database either Compose Compose DB or the Azure database, but Customer running Oracle, very common, right? So, right. so do you force them to change database as Okay, there's the whole strategy about the question is pertaining to cloud migration strategy. There are a couple of strategy, right? You either we host lift and shift. If there's a corresponding version there, you just lift and shift over, whether it's database or application and whatever not, right? But there are other strategy like re-platform. Re, re re-platform application don't change much, but minimally, for example, if you're going to AWS, your database, without changing any of your schema, whatever, your Oracle database, it can exist in RDS Oracle, for example. You change the platform. Or your refactor, you change the entire thing. Use Aurora and whatever not. But all of this decision has to do with first your application. It's a bit difficult to answer a question like that without knowing your application profile, right? without knowing your data criticality, the system criticality. There are different types of systems with different types of profile. The strategy okay. for so migration is, uh, is different. Government agency, which is the most common? government agency has many, many different types of application and system. Right? So we're talking about internet, intranet, data classification, high, medium, low, the, the sensitivity of data and things like that. The, the so-called strategy for migration is always driven, uh, driven by business, in our view. So as we advise agency in the early days of cloud migrations, the strategy itself, we will look at the profile of the application, right? And we look at the needs of the migration because there are a lot of factors. 
cost timeline and things like that. So if you were to come up with a matrix of the six cloud migration strategy that people typically talk about, the other three is retire, uh, 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 basically repurchase, and uh, there's one more that I couldn't quite forgot, but never mind, I don't take up too much time, it's off topic a little bit. But what my point is that it cannot be answered in such a way that all government agencies, if you are using Oracle XR data, we know what is happening to Oracle XR data based on what Gartner says, what Forrester says, for example. Hence, we make a decision out of that. It is not going to be like that. It has to look at the profile of the application, the business side of things, and the need. So in our case, typically when we move from cloud, we will try to use cloud native as much as we can. If we can, we use RDS. If we can, if we can, we use RDS. If not, second choice, stand up your own EC2, install your Oracle on top, right? But we know that there are merits, there are merits to use cloud native. There are merits. That's, the, that's why we go on cloud in the first place, right? So, so I can't give you a full answer to the question, but I'm just calling out the considerations behind, right? So there will be no one quick answer to your question. Sorry. <laughs> A uh, slightly related question, but with regards to the deployment side. So Sorry, I couldn't hear Deployment. Deployment, all right. Yeah. So uh, now you're live, uh, you're now in cloud, and uh, you're doing uh, IAC. Right. Now, uh, how do you uh, manage service availability? Like, say, for example, you update uh, your image. Service availability, okay. If we are talking about uh, the image, the golden image that we are doing, for example, if you are doing a full IAC, the service availability has to do with application and not the infra level, in our view. So if the application itself is stateless, for example, you can do blue-green or canary deployment type, you spin up your application using the latest image, which is patched to the latest patch, for example, then you shut down the old one, then service availability will not be impacted, right? Right? So. But the question is that if the application design itself, because we are doing migration, we are not doing a fresh application. So it is still an on-prem type of application that we didn't manage to do refactoring, we didn't re-architect, for example. It is still web logic, the whole application stack, it is not stateless, for example, it's still stateful, right? So there could potentially be downtime as you do the immutable infra, because every time you spin off, you need to shut down because it will not be able to, to so-called upgrade on its own, right? Something like that. So you do the regular patching way la, through SSM agent or through OMS agent via uh, uh, Azure uh, way of patching, for example. Okay? Ah, sorry. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, just now what you're sharing is very interesting. Yeah. Do you mind share uh, a bit more details about the hardening step? Because I'm particularly interested to know what exactly was done there and which level of like, security hardening <coughs> Okay, uh, a little bit of secret sauce here, so let me think how to answer you. So <laughs> the hardening that we did, basically we are tapping on CIS benchmark, right? So the team has painstakingly la, running through the few hundred lines, right? So hardening, there are a few types of hardening. Windows hardening, you harden on the Windows image itself, Windows 2016 if you are using Windows 2016, or you harden via the GPO if your Windows are part of the domain, that's a Windows side of the world. Red Hat Linux, it is just painstaking, good old-fashioned, line-by-line script to harden, 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 harden. That's, that's, that's how we do it. But of course, we, we did start from scratch. But the key point that we learned from hardening is that we have to use the right benchmark in terms of the hardening. And there are certain things that the hardening benchmark calls out for us to do. We may not be able to fulfill that because some of the hardening benchmark, for example, give you one example. Hardening from CIS will call out uh, things like Oh, if you don't put a customized banner when your system is down, you know, customized banner, you're not hardened, they'll flag it out as a finding. But we won't harden that. We can't because it's application specific. It is agency specific. Whichever customer need to use it, they need to harden it themselves. So that's a little bit to where we harden. And yeah, that's, 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 that's how we do it. Good, good old script, 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 script harden. <laughs> No, no, no magic sauce. Yeah. But you can just buy, buy from Ah, you can pay, you can pay, you can buy. Uh, we, we, we don't, we don't. Uh, government, we, <laughs> we, we, our engineering team attempt to do it ourselves, and we did it. Right. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> 
so, so, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Come. This is a very interesting show. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. But I have one question. One second, you know. Yep. I see right. I see the employee or you test the key challenge in the testing. So how you handle the testing? Let's say when you change the security group. Hmm. I think it's easy. You can pull the CID and pull the name. But when one or two UAT production, they break. So how you do testing before you commit the code in testing? Thank you. In in our context, when we okay, at first I thought you are trying to ask how do we test our IAC. You are not ask. Yeah, yeah. Asking about the testing of the environment when spin off with IAC, the environment itself is no different than any other testing regime that we do. So, so I, I. Not precisely. Yeah, I, I don't quite get that question. Okay, the thing is that you know, telephone mm. when you run play, yep. you get what's going to happen. Yep. And then when you run the play, it actually run the command. Yep. You see a result. But this result, they say, you see, okay, it's nice resource up. Mm. But let's say we talk about the security network, right? Mm. You put some port, open the port, yep. and uh, deny some new port. Yep. So we can write a is okay, but we go to the product, it cannot work. So the thing is that people wrote out how you modify, you know, the run like J unit, we run a unit testing, this result is what we expect that we know. Come on to work. You, you, you have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think this one is. <laughs> okay, there are a few ways you can test this functionality. You can actually check the AWS API. Uh, then, anyone familiar with AWS spec? Uh, basically, you can run a test suite called uh, Kitchen and also use AWS spec to check the AWS API. Is this rule there? You know, you can use uh, similar scripts to go and ask your firewall is this rule here. But if you're asking about testing network connectivity, that's a bit, that's a bit interesting. It's, it's different. Yeah. It's very different. That means you have to access it if, if you can. You do the, this is the ISC, right? You know, when we go out there, it's a journey of the day. Then the people, other team, is kind of done. But actually, you will know if it don't work sometimes. If it's a critical, if it's critical that this test must pass, if it's critical that you must go into the system itself and test this network port, then you write the test for it. You have, to write, you have to find some way to trigger the machine to call out at this port. So uh, that is up to your creativity as a software engineer to find a testing suite that will do this for you. That was why one of the answers that I was trying to answer earlier on is that ISC wouldn't help in a sense in some of those things. It will speed up your creation, your deployment, your changes and things like that and you will guarantee that it's documented down, there's no human error. You can remove that from your mind, say for example, did anyone accidentally open a certain range that is not supposed to be open or certain port supposed to be open is not open, then you go and test it out. But the actual testing regime itself is no difference from your typical, you know, testing. Life cycle. For, for me, I think I look at this yeah. from the policy as code angle. Yeah. Uh, just check what the rules there. To go into the machine and try to connect out the allow it. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to take one last question. Oh. Just to add to that as well, I mean, you have <laughs> the infrastructure that you're deploying and you can write tests as, yes. as explained. Yes. You can start to simulate network traffic. Mm. But ultimately, you need to start looking at implementing observability tooling, monitoring, so that when you actually deploy something, you know that it's actually going to be operating. And so there's a fundamental piece which you haven't really had enough time to talk about at this part mm. is, but when you actually start deploying at scale and start uh, you know, rolling these things over, so you do have canary deploys, you do have rollouts, and you can start seeing some kind of indicators if your application yep. is healthy. Um, but the only way to really truly know if your application is working correctly is by when it's actually starting to get real traffic. So there's two elements of it. There is the testing side of it, but there's also the real traffic side of it. So you have to really look at both. And that's a really fundamental piece that goes beyond the IAC to start looking at how you run and, and operate a network environment and an infrastructure environment as well. So very, very fundamental and very, very important questions for running reliable operating well, systems it was and operating okay. environments. One last question. Okay, the gentleman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So uh, we talk about um, a lot of service brand uh, provisioning over the cloud using Terraform. Um, I assume that you using Terraform Enterprise, which is um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it's. <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is, um, how how you handling on the backend provisioning means that if this new version of the Terraform has been provided before you put in the production, how you make sure that this Terraform is compatible with all the code you wrote. Another thing is whatever the repository you have, you register to the uh, 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 bucket or whatever the repository is used. How you make sure that all the repository is compatible with new version of the Terraform? That's my question. Okay. Um, I've just shared that if we don't spend money to buy the hardening script from CIS, do you think we'll be using Terraform Enterprise? <laughs> so, so okay. Is that a joke? I don't know whether you caught, caught my joke or not, so it's all right. So, so we, we may not be using Terraform Enterprise. Can I share that? Or you uh, we want have to plans. share that? <laughs> we may or may not use Terraform yes. Enterprise. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, we are trying to make that happen. It may or may not manifest. But um, basically, I think your question is really about versioning. About versioning, versioning. versioning. Good practice, good IC practice, fix the versions of the Terraform modules you are referencing. Now, uh, this is if this is in particularly okay. How do I explain this? <laughs> if you are using a JIT remote source for your Terraform modules, it is good practice to fix the version. And when you manually check the Terraform module and see, hey, there's a version bump, do I change it? This is up to your testing. We have manually test to, to check whether the new the new module suits your business case. Already what? Compound, compound. Oh, we are talking about the new Terraform 12, is it? No, I think Terraform 11 is fine. A new Terraform version or a Terraform module version? Terraform version. It doesn't, it doesn't compare, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Terraform 12 has taken such a long time to develop, they made sure that they're backward compatible with Terraform 11. So put the trust on them. Put the trust on? You have to put your trust in something. <laughs> <laughs> Do you trust in God, son? <laughs> 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 uh, okay, fine. If that's the case, then trust in the testing code that you write. Okay, I mean, what I mean to say is, if you upgrade your Terraform, you will be testing out all the code uh, the code you have. I personally I use now. Kitchen. I use EDS spec for now to test uh, the presence of all the uh, all the resources that are requested from the EDS API. You want to share so your experience that code, it I doesn't? I to 12, yeah, and sure. I have the yeah. testing EDS spec share? code to check everything. Sorry, come here. It's got tags, it's got name, it's got this rule, it's got uh, this uh, configuration, my database is there, it's got this username and password, all the testing rules have to be there in your test suite. And when all of that test free, then you know that Terraform 12 is okay for you. Okay? I hope that answers your question. I hope you believe in your code too. <laughs> no, you don't believe in your code. <laughs> Okay, uh, all right, I think we're going to wrap up. I'm going to have this back to Karen? Yes. Uh, so could we ask you before you leave uh, to fill up this short survey to give us some feedback? Actually, my understanding.